It's late 1992. Global superstar Madonna has just released a controversial video for the erotica single, an album of the same name, and a photography book entitled Sex. And just a few short months later in early 93, the erotic thriller Body of Evidence, in which Madonna plays a lead role, bombs at the box office and is savaged by the critics. All of these sexually explicit projects released in quick succession results in a serious backlash from the media, some fans and even the wider public. But somehow or another in the following years, Madonna managed to achieve more success and claw her way slowly but surely back into the public's good books. So just how did she salvage her career from such a PR disaster? How did the backlash affect the woman herself? And how did it influence her artistic choices in the following years in terms of her music, visuals, concerts and movie roles? So many questions, let's find out. Sexuality had always been a big part of Madge's art, but by 1992 it was threatening to completely overshadow it. Up to that point she had weathered numerous controversies throughout her career, but this time she had pissed off too many people, and the media and many of her fans felt that her career was now irrevocably damaged. Despite the sex books selling out and erotica performing respectably, the media portrayed both projects as commercial and critical bombs. All of Madonna's albums, with the exception of her debut, had been number ones in the US and the UK, but erotica stalled at number two. It also became her lowest selling album at the time. Retrospectively, of course, many now agree that Erotica and the Sex Book were groundbreaking projects ahead of their time. The album is widely considered to be one of Madonna's very best works, but in 1992, Madonna was vilified for them. On VH1's Behind the Music documentary from 1998, Marge spoke about the level of vitriol she faced during that time. There was a time when I couldn't open a magazine or a newspaper and not read something incredibly scathing about myself. I did have to put up a wall and work hard to detach myself from caring about what other people think. I did feel I reached an all time low as far as the cruelty of humanity. I never saw so much ugliness in terms of what was directed at me. Madonna is nothing if not a shrewd operator and knew that in order to minimise the damage brought about by all her sex themed projects, another one of her famous reinventions was needed and fast. She made her first attempt at getting back in the media and the fans good graces with the tour to accompany the Erotica album. The girly show, tellingly not named after the album, kicked off at London's Wembley Stadium in September 93, visited five continents and ended in December the same year. The show was noticeably tamer than its predecessor 1990s Blonde Ambition tour, which included Madonna performing like a virgin while simulating masturbation on stage. Whilst the girly show still featured plenty of scantily clad dancers and suggestive performances, the hardcore s and imagery from the last two years was no noticeably absent. The show drew more on the burlesque and the circus themes with obvious Cirque du Soleil references. The tour was well received but like other successful Madonna projects at the time, it kind of got lost in the frenzy surrounding the superstar. In early 94 Madonna released a new single I'll Remember, a more traditional family friendly ballad which marked a departure from her erotica output. It was written with her old collaborator Patrick Leonard and was seen as a return to form and performed well throughout the world. But Madonna's plan to stop pissing people off suffered a setback in March that year when she appeared on the late night show with David Letterman. That interview would infamously become known as the 13 Fucks interview. Along with swearing more than a drunken sailor, Madge used a number of other profanities and was even heckled by the show's audience, but refused to leave the stage. With the interview, many felt that Madonna's career had reached a nadir she might not be able to return from. To mitigate the fallout, Madonna made a more toned down appearance on Jay Leno's show a few weeks later. And at that year's MTV Video Music Awards, she appeared on stage with Letterman as an act of public reconciliation. In another appearance on Letterman in 2009, Madonna talked about the infamous interview. I think I may have made a fool of myself once or twice on your show. I think it may have had something to do with a joint I smoked before I came on. And in 2015, speaking on the Howard Stern show, she had this to say about the incident. One time I was mad at Letterman when I said the F word a lot. I was in a weird mood that day. I was dating Tupac Shakur at the time and he got me all riled up about life in general. So when I went 
went on the show, I was feeling very gangster. In 1993, <laughs> in 1993 the airways were dominated by pop R&B and hip hop sounds. En Vogue and TLC were dominating the charts and Janet Jackson and Tony Braxton were outselling Miss Ciccone. As savvy as ever, Madonna knew she had to update her sound and move with the times or be out of the game. For what would become her sixth studio album, she recruited top American R&B producers to help her craft her new sound. Dallas Austin, who had had big hits with TLC, produced two tracks. Babyface, who had just had a monster hit with Boys to Men and End of the Road, was also chosen along with Dave Jam Hall and trendy British producer Nelly Hooper. And Bedtime Stories was the first time since Like a Virgin Madonna had chosen to collaborate with big name producers. And she decided to leave eroticism behind and head in a more romantic direction. The end result was unapologetic but with a much tamer tone overall. The erotica cover was a graphic rendering of a close-up of Madonna's face who looked to be enjoying something or other. And the back cover featured Madge sucking on somebody's toe. Whoever it was, I hope they didn't have a fungus. The Bedtime Stories cover was a marked contrast. A well-lit portrait with no effects of Madonna making eye contact. In a video recorded for Warner staff before the record's release, Madge had this to say. I know you guys will work this record and you'll also be very happy to know that there are absolutely no sexual references on this album. Not because I've changed or I'm ashamed, not because I have a different outlook on life, I've just exhausted that genre so to speak. And it's a whole new me. I'm going to be a good girl this year, I swear. One of the most infamous incidents of the erotica era occurred in September 92 when Madonna walked the runway at a Jean-Paul Gaultier show and exposed her breasts to the world's media. Fast forward two years later, Madge walks the runway again at a John Paul Gaultier show, but this time she's pushing a pram and looks altogether much more demure. It sent a clear message she had moved on from the erotica era. The lead single, The Mid Tempo Secret, marked a departure in sound. More of an R&B ballad groove than her melodic pop ballads of yore. In the video, there's a baptism which could be interpreted as a sort of renewal after the erotica period. And Madonna is still sexy, just less overtly so. Secret was followed, of course, by the tender ballad Take a Bow, which returned her to the very top of the charts in America, but strangely only reached number 16 in the UK, ending her record-breaking string of 35 consecutive top 10 hits in the country. It was the first time since 1984 one of her singles missed the top 10 in the UK. The album sold well but like Erotica it failed to reach the top spot in the UK or US and trailed significantly behind her biggest selling albums from the 80s. And one year after the release of Bedtime Stories Madonna followed it up with Something to Remember, a retrospective collection of her ballads including three new songs. Human Nature and Bedtime Story, the single, failed to reach the top 40 in America, a problem she hadn't encountered since the early 80s, and Madonna was as keen as ever to keep the ball rolling. The sex book controversy and the Letterman debacle were still fresh in people's memories, and Madge knew there was still work to do to win over the media and the public again. So she conceived the idea of something to remember with the goal of redirecting attention back to her music and songwriting. In the liner notes for Something to Remember, Madonna wrote, So much controversy has swirled around my career this past decade that very little attention gets paid to my music. The songs are all but forgotten. While I have no regrets regarding the choices I have made artistically, I've learned to appreciate the idea of doing things in a simpler way. So without a lot of fanfare, without any distractions, I present to you this collection of ballads. Some are old, some are new, all from the heart. In J. Randy Tarabarelli's biography of the star, an employee from her management team at the time had this to say about that period. She knew it was time to change. She would have to be pretty stupid not to know it. And you could never say that Madonna was stupid. She was upset, a little frantic about what people were saying about her. That's why she put together the Something to Remember album, to remind people there was more to her than the controversy, which had surrounded her almost from the beginning of her career. Her decision to work with David Foster on the album's lead single, You'll See, was especially interesting. Madge tends to favour less mainstream producers 
and at the time David Foster was at the very pinnacle of his career. After producing some of Whitney Houston's songs from the Bodyguard soundtrack. Don't get me wrong, I love his work, but he was and is distinctly unedgy. Even the man himself expressed surprise at the time, saying he didn't think his music was really hip enough for her. But Madonna knew she needed a commercial song after the failure of more adventurous material, such as Human Nature and Bedtime Story, to live up to expectations. You'll See was a big success around the world, and Something to Remember sold over 10 million copies. Whilst Madonna was still a significant player in the industry at this point, she had been eclipsed by other solo female artists commercially, such as Mariah Carey and it seemed this was starting to bother her. She had this to say about Mariah in an interview with Spin magazine in late 95. We have to realise that the same country that acquitted OJ is the same country that makes a complete piece of shit movie number one that buys Mariah Carey records. It's this homogeneity, but it's got nothing to do with art. Mariah was clearly on Madge's mind a lot as she mentioned her again in an interview with NME magazine around the same time. People need something to look to, something to provoke them into questioning whether they completely hate something or completely love something. Perhaps somebody like Mariah Carey wishes she could make that happen. She also talked in the interview about changes in her fan base. I've gone from having a huge fan base to losing a huge fan base to having a kind of fluctuating fan base. I've always had a core of fans who've stuck by me. I may not be as popular as I once was, but people are starting to respect me as an artist more. Mariah responded to the put downs by saying that she hadn't paid much attention to Madonna since Mariah herself was in the eighth grade, when Madonna was last popular. I included these quotes not to wind fans up, but because I thought they were a very telling indication of how Madonna felt about no longer being the leader of the pack commercially. With both superstars in the years since have been very complimentary about one another in interviews. And Madge didn't just switch things up when it came to her music, she also adopted a new approach when it came to choosing movie roles. She took on some smaller roles in Four Rooms and Blue in the Face in 95. But it was the lead role of Ava Peron in the musical Evita that Madge coveted the most. Although she had been lobbying for the role for many years and felt very passionate about the story, she also knew that it was the perfect vehicle to help reshape her image. A lead role in a mainstream musical was a long way from the shock antics and the furore of the erotica era. In J. Randy Tarabarelli's book on the superstar, the author writes about how Madge reportedly told a friend at the time, A couple of years ago, no one would have cared if I died. People were so sick of me. I only hope that will change with the movie. And throughout the production of the movie, Madonna expressed concern about the portrayal of Ava. In Lucy O'Brien's biography of the superstar Like an Icon, the author writes about Madonna's concern for the character's depiction and her own public image. Madonna lobbied throughout to have a more sympathetic portrayal of Ava Peron. Alan Parker was keen to emphasise in the film the shrewd manipulator who connived her way to success, whereas Madonna, over-identifying with the part and concerned with her own image, wanted to project a softer, quieter strength. Madonna's persistence paid off and when the movie was released at the end of 96, it became a commercial and critical success. And Madge was nominated for some decent awards this time, not just Golden Raspberries as in previous years, and won the 1997 Golden Globe Award for Best Actress in a Comedy or Musical. In the aftermath of the Erotica album and the sex book, Madonna weathered a storm which would have caused other artists to retreat from the spotlight or give up entirely. And her plan to get back in the public's good graces was completed the following year when she released her comeback album Ray of Light, which not only returned her to the top of the charts around the world, but also allowed her to reclaim her title as the undisputed Queen of Pop. Thanks for watching. If you have any thoughts on anything in this video, please leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my other videos.